So five years ago, had you told me that I'd be giving a TED Talk all about why it's so important for men to talk about their health, I would have told you that you were crazy. It wasn't something that I thought was a problem or something that men really needed to talk about. But I'm here today talking about why humor is a great way to get guys to talk about their health. So I guess hindsight being 2020, it's me who is truly nuts. <laughs> Back in October 2016, I was doing my monthly testicular self-exam, and I noticed there was now a lump on the left one. It hadn't been there in the previous month, and I knew it shouldn't have been there at all. But I was really hesitant to call a doctor. I was embarrassed based on the location of the lump. So initially, I was just going to kind of play this one close to the chest, or I suppose more accurately, close to the groin. But I decided that I also didn't want to admit that I had a problem. Because I was 25 years old at the time. I was otherwise healthy. I thought I was invincible. And it turns out that this isn't isolated just to me. Because it's been found that over 60% of guys will wait as long as possible to see a doctor, even when they have obvious signs, symptoms, or pain. But beyond the embarrassment and not wanting to admit that I was indeed a mortal man, I also didn't have a doctor that I could call. Because I hadn't been to the doctor for any reason for about three years prior to detecting this lump. And again, this isn't atypical of men in general because about only 50% of men actually engage in preventative care through an annual physical. But a couple days of worry eventually turned into about two weeks of anxiety, and I decided it was time to pick up the phone. And I will tell you that calling a brand new doctor for the very first time solely to ask them to examine your testicles <laughs> is just as awkward as it sounds. <laughs> I'm not even the kind of guy who generally kisses on the first date. But I went in for the appointment, and they determined, yes, there was a lump on my testicle. So they ordered an ultrasound, or as I like to call them, a baltrasound. <laughs> the baltrasound revealed, yes, there was a mass on my testicle, so they sent me to a urologist. And I'll always remember walking into his office, no idea that life was about to throw me a curveball. He said, Justin, based on the results of your ultrasound, it appears you have testicular cancer and we're going to need to remove the testicle immediately. Now, I was not a fan of this plan. Because <laughs> I had grown rather attached to my testicles over the past 25 years. Or I suppose more accurately, they, never mind, you get it. <laughs> but since it was quite literally a matter of life and death, I decided to go forward with the surgery. And two days later, I had the operation done. While the procedure overall was uneventful, I will also tell you it was certainly not a ball. And three years ago, actually to the day, I'm sitting back in his office and waiting for the results of my follow-up scans. He said, Justin, there's no easy way to put this, but your cancer spread, and now you're going to need chemotherapy. Talk about getting hit by a wrecking ball. So like any self-respecting millennial will do, I took to the internet to find my answers. And while you can find practically anything on the internet, the one thing I was unable to find was a comprehensive guide of what it's like to go through chemotherapy as a 20-something-year-old guy, written from the perspective of a 20-something-year-old guy. So I realized at this point, now, the ball was finally back in my court. <laughs> and I could craft this resource for the next version of Justin who came along. So on the very first day of chemotherapy, I decided to start writing my story, detailing everything from starting to finishing chemotherapy and highlighting what it'd be like to live the rest of my life one pilot short of a full cockpit. <laughs> and thus, a ballsy sense of tumor was born. And as I read more, <laughs> I'll let you simmer in that one. <laughs> and as I read more and more about men's health, I learned a lot of very interesting things such as the fact that 56% of men prefer to keep their health concerns to themselves and not share it with anyone. But what concerns me more is that this often starts in childhood. Because it's been found that about 41% of men were told as children that health is something they shouldn't complain about. But what does this mean 
And what does that sound like? I know to some kids, it sounds like walk it off. Don't be a girl. Rub some dirt on it. In my own childhood, it sounded a lot like big boys don't cry. And while no one seems to think about the harm that we're doing to these children, or intends to harm, what happens when we're instilling so much shame and stigma in these young boys in their formative years? Well, I've talked to a lot of guys over the past couple of years, and overwhelmingly, I've found that they feel conditioned to believe that talking about their health is a sign of weakness. And it's so interesting to me that we're nearly a quarter of the way through the 21st century, where we're having so many important discussions about changing gender norms and societal constructs, but men are still feeling this way. So one thing becomes abundantly clear to me, that on the topic of men's health, somewhere along the way, guys, We've really dropped the ball. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because even some of our most iconic men throughout history have known the importance of taking care of their health. Take, for example, John Wayne. While his on-screen persona was that of a rough and tumble cowboy who would get shot off his horse, climb right back in the saddle, and ride off into the sunset without a single complaint or grimace, he handled his health very differently off-screen. When he was in his late 50s, he got really sick. And what started out as a coughing fit that interrupted filming turned out to be lung cancer. But because he got himself to the doctor early, they were able to successfully operate. And 10 weeks after the surgery, he made the ballsy decision to go forward in a press conference to announce to the world that he had licked the big C. And although this was out of the norm for the time, he then became a staunch advocate for early detection preventative care for the remainder of his life. He even appeared in a commercial for the American Cancer Society in 1971, urging others to get a checkup and nagging their loved ones into getting a checkup. But I'm not John Wayne. His is an iconic duo of his cowboy hat and his trusty pistol, and I don't even have the pair I was born with. But what I do have is a new set that works for me, humor and education. Because I found that humor is a great way to get the ball rolling on otherwise uncomfortable conversations about men's health. Because let's face it, men already use a ton of genitalia-related humor in their everyday conversations. <laughs> I can't even tell you how many times when I started working, I said I'd give up my left nut for a week off of work. You get what you wish for. But rather than letting these be one-off remarks, why don't we use them to break the ice and have a more important conversation? Because humor acts as a natural connector for people, and it sets their mind at ease. And neuroscience even shows that humor has a positive impact on retention and memory. Take, for example, a conversation I had with my friend Brett. Around the time of my diagnosis, Brett had recently gotten engaged to his boyfriend. I was curious if Brett and Colton were now doing their self-exams, so I simply reached out to ask. Brett said that he now was, but he had no idea if Colton had been. I could have really laid into Brett and say, hey, you're going to be marrying this guy. You need to make sure he's doing these. But I realized that wouldn't be effective. So I merely suggested that they make it a date night. <laughs> And a couple of weeks ago, as I was getting ready for this talk, I actually reached out to Brett to see if he remembered this conversation. And it turns out that he did. And he said because it was approached with humor versus a lecture, they have now made it part of their monthly date nights. <laughs> he was even so appreciative that he took it upon himself to invite me to their date night later this month. <laughs> so I think it really is humor that can open the doorways to talking about men's health. Because let's face it, no man wants a lecture, least of all about his health. I mean, in fact, the only thing you're going to do by lecturing a man about his health is make him downright testy. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I'm just one man with just one testicle. <laughs> and while this talk has been all about men's health, it's something that does truly affect us all. Because regardless of your gender, Everybody has a man that's important to them, whether it's a father or son, 
or a brother or husband or a close friend. We each and every single one of us have a man that we care about. And when men don't take care of their health, the outcomes are often dire. Women outlive men by an average of five years. And mortality rates from cancer are one and a half times higher for men than they are for women. Oftentimes because men are diagnosed at a later stage, which makes it harder to treat. So we all need to work together to encourage men to sack up and to speak up when it comes to matters of their health. And these conversations need to start happening today because there's no time like the present. We need to seize the moment. Carpe scrotium, if you will. <laughs> because it's only once we've all joined together to help men prioritize taking care of and talking about their health that we can make sure that we're all truly on the ball. <laughs> Thank you.